Right now, there's a large collaboration between SpaceX and NASA with the aim to significantly drive down the cost of space travel and to inspire the minds of students all over the world. Through their history, NASA is no stranger to partnering with private companies to work on unique and ambitious projects that have led to innovations in science, technology, and life as we know it. However, none have arguably been as unique as NASA's past venture into the leisure market during their collaboration with Disney and the creation of Mission Space. This video is extremely spoiler heavy, so if you've yet to write Mission Space, consider this your warning. However, if you like the impact technology and want to see how they pulled it off, then you're in the right place. Today, we'll take an in-depth look at one of the most infamous rides at Epcot, Mission Space. We'll take a look at its history, turn on the house lights, and pull back the curtain to show you how this ride rocketed to the top as one of Disney's most intense experiences. So sit back, relax, or stand in a queue line, which you're probably already doing, because this is how Mission Space works. Mission Space was the long-awaited and perhaps the most controversial replacement for the heavily beloved Horizon's Dark Ride after it met its unforeseen demise in early 1999. With a large sinkhole jeopardizing the structural integrity of the building Horizons occupied, Disney sought after what they believed would be a worthy successor that would not only fit the future world mission, but provide an unparalleled experience only Disney could offer. More or less. Construction for the land the ride sits on began with the unsightly demolition of their iconic Horizon show building, leaving nothing in the aftermath. Disney claimed that the building for Mission Space was so large it couldn't possibly fit within the old one, which as we know was just a flat lie. To resolve the sinkhole formation on site, steel girders were placed into the ground vertically to prevent any shear or vertical loading from having adverse or negative impacts on the new building. During foundation work, careful eyed onlookers and park fans noticed four distinct zones within the building's foundation, each with what appeared to be a large ring with connection points in the middle. With this large observation in mind, speculation ran absolutely rampant with what Disney could be bringing to Epcot and if it would live up to its predecessor. In collaboration with NASA and HP, the three would put their heads together to devise a ride themed to training for space travel through the fictitious International Space Training Center and using simulators and other equipment based on what NASA used to train the M-Prime their astronauts headed to space. Disney would provide the creative work, NASA would assist in the ride system's design, and HP would slap their name on it after funding a large chunk of the ride. This new simulator ride would allow guests to experience what it's like blasting off into space within a crash course adventure. There was just one little minor string attached. Mission Space soft opened on June 9, 2003, but didn't officially open until October 3rd of that year. The opening was attended by the heads of each firm as well as multiple astronauts to officially commemorate the opening of the soon-to-be iconic or more infamous attraction. From the opening, guests and fans were intrigued by the intense experience delivered by the ride system along with the modern and immersive cabins and museum-style queue. While the ride boasted an intense, cutting-edge experience, the shine and allure of the ride quickly wore down as the experience perhaps was a bit more pressing than expected on riders. Months after the opening, sickness bags were installed into the cabins should a rider feel the effects of the ride too much. Additionally, the ride also brought up many adverse effects for riders that were unaware of underlying health conditions, which also led to two untimely deaths. Needing to take immediate action, Disney, after the second death, unveiled that the ride would be outfitted with far more safety advisories through the queue in order to sufficiently warn riders what they were about to experience. Often, even to this day, riders have no idea what kind of ride mission space is. Moreover, Disney announced that two of the ride bays would run with their main feature disabled, the Centrifuge, starting in 2006. This was the main factor that led to the designation as one of the most intense rides Disney had created. So let's turn on those house lights and see how mission space works. To increase throughput, there are four centrifuge ride bays. Riders are split into 10 groups of four and are sent to wait at five entry doors around the centrifuge ride bay. When the doors open to load riders, each group of four riders enters into one cabin each. 
In order to understand the ride in general, let's take a look at how each cabin works. Each rider sits in a confined box within the X2 flight trainer cabin. To secure riders, a simple over-the-shoulder restraint is used to keep riders from jostling around during the ride. These seats are confined in order to reduce motion sickness. In addition, small fans are located to the sides of riders to blow cold air to prevent motion sickness often caused or triggered by heat exhaustion. In front of riders is a large control console with many buttons and joysticks that will come in handy during the ride. Further in front of each rider is the early installation of a 3D parallax screen similar to 3D TVs that require no glasses. Developed in collaboration with Walt Disney Imagineering, the system uses two screens and angled glass to provide the left and right eyes slightly different views, presenting riders' minds with a perceived three-dimensional view out of their cabin. Each cabin is articulated on two pivot points around the rider's heart line and through the center to roll the cabin left and right. This articulation is performed by electric actuators which use a stepper motor and a lead screw to move a ram that manipulates the position of the cabin. These actuators not only eliminate the need for pneumatic or hydraulic equipment, but rid the ride of another point of potential failure as electric actuators are more reliable. For the purpose of detail, I've created this 3D printed model of the entire ride system. As mentioned earlier, riders load through five bay doors around the centrifuge. This centrifuge is about 60 feet in diameter with 10 arms spreading out from the center and was created by Environmental Tektronix Corporation. In order to expedite the loading and unloading process, the arms are split into five pairs and each arm is not equidistant from the next. This allows for a wider gap between every two cabins, allowing riders to load from one side where the gap is smaller and exit on the other side where the gap is larger, forming an exit trail. Each cabin has communication and power cables that run up to a localized comm box. These cable connections not only control everything happening in the cabin, but allow the resulting cables headed back to the center of the centrifuge to be reduced. In the middle of the centrifuge is a large bus bar slip ring system that assures the electronics a secure and reliable connection to power while still allowing the arm to spin, and spin does it ever. The centrifuge and resulting centripetal forces exerted on the riders are thanks to the variable motor located in the bottom of the base of the centrifuge. However, the centrifuge is actually secured 30 feet down in the basement where the drive motor is. This powerful motor pushes a large bull gear that ramps the arms up to about 16 to 17 rotations per minute maximum. This may sound rather tame, but at its size, each cabin is now moving at 35 miles per hour and exerting 2.5 Gs in riders, or about 2.5 times your body weight. Another side note is that during the ride sequence, the floors just under the cabins drop out to avoid collisions from the tilting feature. Now that we understand each part of the ride, let's put it all together. As before, you'll be split into 10 groups of 4 to fill the 4 different positions within the cabin. You'll enter through the 5 doors on the outside of the centrifuge and load into your seats and down the street. Prior to the start of the ride, attendants use an outside mounted panel to lean the console within close quarters of riders, confining them to their seat and immersing them in the cabin. The other green light is to confirm the restraints are all locked. The doors then close and the riders become situated at the controls that are used during their flight. When cleared, the floors beneath the cabins are tracked down out of the way. Depending on which side you've chosen, a different sequence will unfold in front of you. Both the green team and orange team both used to offer the single mission to Mars. But as of late 2017, a new orbit around Earth mission was created by International Light and Magic, as well as updated graphics for the Mars mission still offered on the orange side. Oddly enough, the sequence of both missions is nearly identical in cabin movements, which eliminated the need to program a completely new ride sequence for the new video. Now that we understand all the mechanics of the ride, let's hop aboard the Orange Team's mission to Mars and we'll explain how it pulls it all off. Thanks to Roland and Dave on YouTube, we have a centrifuge view of the green mission, which is essentially the same thing as the Orange Team mission without the spinning. Or so I thought. As we can see, the flooring below the cabins retracts downward in order to prevent collisions. Riders are now being tilted onto their backs to simulate the prep for launch. In order to simulate acceleration, this classic tilting method is used in place of real linear acceleration that isn't possible due to the ride system.
In the green mission, the cabin tilts forward slightly in order to gain some more space. It can then be used for a larger launch acceleration. In the first stage is separated, the cabin is tilted forward to simulate a loss of the first stage. To simulate zero gravity, the cabin is tilted slightly forward to take the rider's weight off the seat back. Here, the cabin is being tilted back again to simulate the start of the second stage. At this point, the cabin is rocked left and right to mimic the activation of the gravity-assisted slingshot around the moon. Similar to the zero-gravity motion, the hypersleep motion involves tilting the cabin slightly forward to ease riders into a sense of calm. We then wake up to a meteor shower over the landing site and riders are tossed back and forth as they try to avoid collision after collision. The rocket descent motion has the tilt actuators fully retract, tilting the cabin and riders to about 25 degrees as they descend onto Mars face first. The gliding wing sequence now forces riders onto the back to imitate as if wings were suddenly taking over the flight path of the cabin. Now that we have lost autopilot, the ride system now allows for a bit of interactivity by having riders control their flight through the terrain of Mars. On the old green mission where the centrifuge isn't supposed to spin, it actually does still spin, but only one revolution around. Skidding onto the runway, the cabin tilts forward where riders try to gain control of their rough landing. Finally, as the ice breaks, the cabin is tilted far forward and finally rocked back to safety. Mission technically accomplished. The floors come back up, the restraints unlock, the door swings open, and riders can now safely dizzy walk out of the cabins making the way into the middle of the centrifuge, down the long hallway, and of course, say it with me, exit through the gift shop. So why did the centrifuge still spin that one time? The centrifuge of the green team side is likely still used for one rotation in order to give slight forces. It's also likely used because not maintaining the centrifuge would pose aging and safety risks for the equipment and riders. Altogether, this technology works in unison to create a seamless and thrilling adventure that has amazed and inspired millions of riders and will continue to do so for decades to come. I hope you've enjoyed this small dive into how Mission Space works. If you still have questions, you can ask them below and let me know what your favorite ride is and I might try to make a video on it. Also, make sure to take a look at our other How It Works videos in the iCard above. Please subscribe, ring the bell, and if you really enjoyed the video, please consider joining my Patreon for as little as $1 a month. If you spotted all five gears, comment the combined code below and you'll get a shout out in the next video. Once again, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the parks.